offering of music and facilitating our singing this morning. We appreciate that. Well, it is time once again to turn to God's Word together. And so I always encourage you to keep that Word in front of you over the next uh, few minutes as we consider Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, Colossians. We'll be reading from Colossians chapter 1 this morning. The Apostle has heard from Epaphras. He has met personally with Epaphras who has shared with him some very encouraging things about this church in Colossae. They have at least borne some fruit of hearing the gospel, a fruit in, in love for one another, love for the saints, and maybe passing through the, the town of Colossae. Uh, so it's very encouraging to the apostle, but also he's heard some discouraging things, things that they may be hearing in the church as a fairly young church, uh, somewhat naive perhaps to the dangers of, of false teaching and that uh, we don't know what kind of teachers had found their way into the church or the, the exact nature of the issues that they were introducing but it seemed to to undermine the truth of the gospel and the sufficiency of what the the church had received uh, from Epaphras so that that they're thinking well maybe we're missing something maybe there's more to this gospel than what we've heard uh, some new revelation or a, a deeper experience even um, in order to, to supply for their spiritual needs. And so Paul petitions the Lord on their behalf, uh, gives thanks for this church and his introduction. And you may recall that, that the very foundation of that thanks, his gratitude, is for their deliverance from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the Father's beloved Son. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Now they, they live as citizens, saints, uh, in this new kingdom. Um, so Paul doesn't just jump in, which he does some other times, in running to different churches, doesn't jump in right at the problem and address this issue. Instead, he sings for them, in a way. He gives them this poetic description and exaltation of, of the power of the beloved Son. Uh, there are many who believe that the verses we're going to read here in a moment were part of an existing hymn that had been circulating in the churches at this time. Or maybe you know, even if, uh, if it wasn't original to the, to the apostle that he was adapting this language uh, for the context. And I think either way is plausible. Um, either, way, either way is simply amazing. When you think that this is, the verses we're going to read, that this is within 30 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so this is how the church is, is describing from its earliest days what they understood of Jesus. They understood about him and who he was and what glory could be attributed uh, to the Son. So we're going to read verses 15 through 20 of Colossians 1. You know what, I'm going to, let me back up just a couple of verses so we get the context understand the subject he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins he the beloved son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You really have to catch your breath when you read verses like that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to approach your throne of grace in the name of Christ and for his sake, the name of the beloved Son, the name above every name. And as we read about the power and glory and supremacy of our Savior, Lord, we are in awe that you would reveal this to us, 
that you would show yourself to us through your word. Lord, deepen our faith and our love for you in this time. Help us as we consider the grandeur of this word and what it means for us as your new creation, as your church. I pray this in Christ's name, amen. There is a, there's a growing discussion in the Western church, particularly a church here in the U.S., on, uh, about the proper relationship between the church and between uh, the state uh, and how those in the church should interact uh, with the state. And, and uh, the, you know, that, that debate is nothing new, but uh, we see as, as the moral breakdown uh, in the culture and that gap widening between the, the values and the ideas of the general population and the values of the church, these questions just resurface. Should faithful Christians engage or or disengage? Is it is it wise, reasonable for Christians to uh, pray that the nation would be more Christian? Is there a distinction between living as a faithful Christian in a particular nation and being a Christian nationalist? Maybe you've heard that term thrown out. So what what some in the church believe to be a you know, an idolatrous focus on the nation others consider to be faithfulness. So there's no easy answer to these questions. It just goes on and on. But one thing is clear, and has been clear for a long time, is that claiming a nation to be Christian does not make it a Christian nation. We, we could have every leader from, from the local level all the way to the top and the national level claim to be disciples of Jesus and say, we here in the United States, we are a... We are a Christian nation, a Christian people, and that would make us no more of a Christian nation than before. Um, kind of like the popular, quite prosperous, name it and claim it teachers. We'll pluck a verse, twist it a little bit, keep, you know, and just keep the attention on themselves. Just, just claim it. Name it. And if you claim it correctly and follow these steps that we have for you, well, then, um, then whatever power that resides in you will make it so. You can't just claim it. You can't just name it. And we, we get a sense that this is what was happening in Colossae. The, the church has heard the gospel of salvation in Christ, and the teachers among them are probably affirming that what they've heard was good, that it was true. That they're, they're likely doing, okay, you've, you've received the, the benefits of salvation in Christ. You know about the saving work of the cross. That's fine and good. That's you know, that's one thing, but to really enjoy those benefits and to live empowered by the Spirit of God, well, that's, that's something else. You need to claim that victory. Oh, and we've got the ticket for you to do that. You, you need this message. Epaphras, he got you started, but if you want to be fully qualified, enjoy full life in Christ, then you need to focus on some other things, and you need us for that. And so... The, the apostle urges this church, don't fall for this. Look to Christ. Make much of Christ. See with, with eyes of, of faith the full supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus in your life. The supremacy of Jesus over all things. That they are fully qualified in Christ. All they need for a life of faith, for a life of obedience to God is found here in the beloved Son. So Christ is supreme and Christ is sufficient. See that clearly in these verses. Um, this is Jesus, the God-man in all of his power and glory. And so Paul writes that the beloved Son is the image of the invisible God, the very nature of God. His character, his attributes are visible and known in his Son and through his Son. There's no mistaking here the reference to the incarnation. Jesus is the visible embodiment of the invisible God. Last week in our youth Sunday school class, I asked the students to draw a caricature of me. So this is very interesting. So, so I sat in the, in the middle of the room, and so they were, they were sitting around me, so they each had a little different perspective on where I was sitting. I just said, go for it. You know, make a, make a character. Now, I'm guessing not many of you have seen those drawings because they disappeared quite quickly after the class. 
But I, I imagine that if you were to look at these drawings, you, you probably could have, you know, recognized that it was me. They, they really did, they did a pretty good job. Uh, we talked about what a, uh, what a character is in, in, in picking out certain features. A uh, character accentuates certain features and not others so that it's recognizable. When we look at Jesus and we hear that he's the image of the invisible God, we're not talking about a character. Jesus doesn't uh, accentuate certain features or attributes of God and not others. He is, as Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, the exact imprint of his nature. In the beginning, God speaks and it is done. We read that in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus speaks and it is done. He commands the, the winds and the waves, peace be still, instant obedience. He commands the demons, be silent, come out of him. He overturns death itself, Lazarus, come forth. The creator has entered his creation. Contemporary artist sings this, the author of the story has become a page within the book. Marvelous. What other religion? Can you think of what other worldview has a God like this? A God of such power and authority and control. A God who's transcendent over all things and yet, right here, is knowable. Entering into that creation. It can be known to remake, restore, not only as image bearers, but restore all things. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And the firstborn of all creation. The apostle is not simply referring here to a, a birth order, but the significance of that birth order. The firstborn child at this time was given a unique place uh, within the family. The child uh, given certain authority and responsibility to care for the rest of the family, to care for the family name. And so, uh, you know, a, a double inheritance was given to the firstborn so that they could that could be used to provide for the family. So Jesus, as the firstborn of all creation, he's given that, that authority. He's a responsible agent, the supreme authority over all creation. And this really is all creation, all that we can see, hear, touch, smell. But in case you know, there's any doubt, Paul expands this description right into the invisible. He wants to leave no doubt in our minds and in these, these saints of Christ in Colossae, that, that, that Jesus reigns over everything that exists. He's the ultimate master and ruler. And now those thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities, we don't need to slice and dice those terms to understand what Paul is saying. Christ is supreme over all. The material, he's supreme over all spiritual realm. He holds it all together. It all exists because of him. It all exists for him. You know, this is why Martin Luther, he could write with such confidence. Those words have been fuel for the faith of the church for so many years. He writes, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. What is, that? what is that word? It's the word above all earthly powers, he goes on to write. It is the living word of God incarnate. The word that was with God in the beginning and the word that was God. Church family, we exist for the glory of God to enjoy Him and to enjoy His beloved Son. So if you want to see the power of God, you want to see this, you want to experience the power of God, it's not some special knowledge, not some incantation, it's not some prayer you can make or some prayer someone can make for you, it's not some spiritual gift. Look at the Lord Jesus. Look at the Lord Jesus and His, and his coming, His appearance. His appearance the first time in, in the incarnation, His a second appearance that we look forward to in resurrection. Love how Paul brings these together. He, he celebrates the coming of Christ on both occasions 
when he writes to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our great, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the church lives right there in between, in the between the past and future appearances of Christ. And as we share in His suffering, so we share in His glory. So as you and I live in this space and embrace the truth that there is nothing outside the rule of Christ, that grows our desire and our ability to worship, to enjoy Him, to submit to His Lordship in all things. Jesus is the author, the king of creation, supreme over, over all existing creation, but over all of the new creation. And we see here in verse 18, he's talking about the church. And he is the head of the body, the church. Did you know that the church is God's design for his world? He is reforming his image bearers into the divine image that is Christ. So the church is this new humanity with Christ as its head. The church is his body. And so he rules and governs and holds it all together. The universal church, Trinity Fellowship Church, is entirely dependent upon Christ for its life. The body is not going to survive unless it holds fast to the head, unless it holds fast to Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. We get all of these beautiful phrases. So in verse 14, he's the firstborn of all creation and now the firstborn from the dead. So this just puts an exclamation mark on his resurrection. Jesus is the first of many. There's a great resurrection to come. This is the resurrection that we long for. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But here's the great mystery, he goes on to say. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. What does that mean? What is is that change going to look like? John helps us with this. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So the church victorious, the church resurrected will share in the inheritance of the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. In everything, Jesus takes first place. Everything, he takes the the prime place. In the new creation, in the church, the, the primacy, the priority of our attention, of our worship, belongs to Christ. Just as a church in, in Colossae needed to hear this, we need to hear this because when other people or other, other things in the church claim too much primacy, it's not only unhealthy, it's dangerous. There, there seems to be other teachers, other leaders coming into the church saying, you've heard from Epaphras and what he shared as a priority, now you need to hear from us and the priorities we have and, and the, that primacy has shifted. One pastor comments here, it's it's helpful. When we take our minds and hearts away from Christ and His Word, human authority and traditions will always fill the vacuum. Always. Really at the heart of the reformation of the church in the 16th century. The early reformers, they lamented. Oh, how they, they, they lamented this. And they were forced to respond to the shifting primacy away from Christ and His Word to the authority of appointed leaders and traditions. Christ is, must be recognized as preeminent in the life of the church. So Lord Jesus is supreme over all. He's sufficient, uh, sufficient in His person and in His work. I want us to see here the fullness of God. 
the fullness of Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, was pleased to dwell in Christ. Verse 19. God takes a human nature but retains His divine nature in the incarnation. Think in the, in the Old Testament under the under the Old Covenant, the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It filled the temple. This was God's house. This was His dwelling place among His people. This was the place where sacrifice and atonement was centered. And this changes with the coming of Jesus. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. God dwells with His people in Jesus, the central place for sacrifice and atonement is now found with Jesus. He is wholly sufficient in His person. He is God with us. God with us and God for us in reconciliation. It should be clear in verse 20 that all human beings have a need And not just humanity, but all creation has a need to be reconciled to God. I don't know if you noticed, but things are not the way they're supposed to be. Not the way they're supposed to be in in me, in you. Not the way they're supposed to be in, in the creation that surrounds us. Paul writes to the church in Rome that all creation is waiting, longing, yearning for the glory of the church the reign of God's kingdom. So we're groaning for the resurrection, the consummation of the kingdom of God, the unveiling of our hope. We can can only share this hope because God is for us, because He has reconciled us to Himself. We'll talk some more about reconciliation uh, next week in the verses to come. But for now, we need to hear that Christ, Christ alone is sufficient to reconcile all things to God. All creation will share in in the glory and joy of being restored and at peace with the Creator through the cross. 1 John chapter 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that does not mean that every human being uh, will be saved. Or that the blood of Christ has propitiated or atoned for the sins of every human being. It's very important. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. His blood atones for all those whom the Father has given him. All who are saved by the grace and mercy of God will be reconciled by the blood of the cross. Dick Lucas makes a helpful comment here. Christ reconciles all because there is no other mediator capable of reconciling any. Christ reconciles all, no other capable. Jesus is the only sufficient Savior. So think, when when are you and I tempted to add to the sufficiency of Christ? Just think about that. It may be, maybe through spiritual disciplines, actually. Or maybe we think we're making certain sacrifices for the body of Christ or sacrifices for our family. And I think consciously, consciously we're not really thinking, well, this is, this may be earning my salvation before the Father, but subconsciously, you know, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. So here's where we need the wisdom of the Spirit. Grace that God gives because good works that validate our faith could be the good works that we're adding to our faith. We're losing sight of the sufficiency of our Savior. The grace of God in Christ, that's the sufficient condition for your life and faith. The motivation to holiness. So we love because He loved us. We serve because He has served us. We give because He has given for us. We commit because He is committed to us. We pray because He intercedes for us. Jesus is sufficient in the lives of His people. So Paul's message here rings true for the church throughout the ages. Jesus is supreme. He's the indisputable Lord of the universe. And that Lordship extends to everything, everything 
the, the existence of all things, but the continued existence of all things, material and spiritual. And this lordship, this lordship is intentional. I mean, Christ took the role of a suffering servant for the purpose of reconciling all things to himself. I mean, that, that's very intentional. That is very personal. That is a God who says, you are precious in my eyes, and I love you. He has loved you, fellow Christian, from before the foundation of the world, and he will always love you. So as a church, we serve the one who is supreme over all things, one who is the church's only sure foundation. We are his new creation by the Spirit and the Word. From heaven he came and sought us to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought us and for our life he died. All praise and glory to the beloved Son. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we exalt you the beloved Son and King over all. Lord, you are the creator and sustainer of all things that you have made, and you are the only sufficient redeemer of your world. Lord, we praise you for this grace, mercy, the love that you've shown to us in Christ. And would you be glorified and preeminent in our midst? in our gathering here and as we leave this place. May you be preeminent as you bring about your new creation in us. Pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, let's